Well, hello everyone. Hi, JK. Hi. I have to say good evening or good afternoon. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. May, maybe it's time for studying, so can we start? I think so. Yeah, welcome to this meeting. Uh, this meeting is a I mean, new working group meeting with IMPC, uh, focusing on old action and the uh, neural disease and a neural degenerative disease. And I and a Kent organized this meeting. So this is uh, just the first online meeting uh, focusing on old action and uh, its application. So I just to uh, briefly introduce, I mean, this meeting with Kent. So Harpy, could you prepare the, just to PowerPoint file? It's loading, yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Happy now you are loading. Well, yeah. Can yeah, you see them now? Yeah, it's yeah. It's now yeah. green on. Yeah, yeah. Finally, yeah. excellent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, please, second one. Yeah, the second pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we invited, I mean, three speakers, and uh, Chang Won Kim, and uh, Nixon Abraham, and uh, Sylvia Mandeler. And uh, <clears throat> this is I mean, just the first meeting. And uh, the title is, I mean, Neurodegenerative Consequence of Genetic Defects in Taste and uh, Olfactory Genes in IMPC Mice. Even though we already know olfaction and taste is very important key issues uh, for defining a new uh, aspect of uh, several kinds of disease, However, the kind of uh, trial has not been done in with an IMPC platforms. So this is I mean, a new challenge for all of us. And uh, I just wanted to deliver my chance to Kent. Kent, now you can see. All right, thank you. Thank you, JK. Uh, let's go on to the next uh, slide, Poppy. So my name is uh, Kent Lloyd. I'm at the University of California, Davis, uh, bright and early here uh, this morning. Um, you know, we have this it's always uh, a little bit of a challenge to have um, uh, such a workshop involving the entire world. So um, that's why we have uh, the order of our speakers uh, is, are, is put in an order to make it most convenient for them because they're either up very, very late in the evening or they're up very, very early in the morning. So that's the reason for the order of speakers. Uh, before we begin, I just wanna make sure that everyone has a a good overview of the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, which is hosting this workshop today. Um, the IMPC has been around now for uh, almost 13 years. Our mission and goals is, are to build the first truly comprehensive functional catalog 
of the mammalian genome. It's really one of the, the biggest projects uh, since the sequ human genome sequencing project, which was, of course, important for defining the uh, sequence of letters in the genome. But what the IMPC does, it goes the next step to define the function of those letters as genes in the genome. So a very, very important project involving uh, more than a dozen laboratories around the world on five continents. Um, so what we're doing is we're systematically phenotyping well, close to 20,000 knockout mouse strains, uh, one for each gene, really to focus on covering the human orthologous genes in the mouse genome. So where are we at this point? We have over 8,700 genes that have undergone adult phenotyping. And when we find that the uh, adult uh, cannot be made because the gene is an embryonic lethal when it's knocked out, then we do embryo phenotyping as well. The project is still ongoing, so we hope to add a few more thousand genes over the next few years. Now, very importantly, uh, this is important for, this is uh, of use to you because all of the data presented, produced by the IMPC laboratories are freely available to you on the website. And you can see the address in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, www.mousephenotype.org. Um, not only the data, but all of the mice are also available to you. So the mice that have been made and phenotyped are all available in public repositories around the world. So from that website, you can also scroll to the bottom of the uh, page for a particular gene and uh, order the mice for your research. And it doesn't matter if the mouse is in the United States, is it in uh, Taiwan, is it in France, uh, is it in India, you'll be able to uh, access those mice for your research wherever you are. And so far, there's more than 7,000 publications uh, by the research community using these IMPC resources. Um, we're committed to open science. We want to get this information out to you. It's very valuable. Our, really, we want to define, especially we want to define the uh, function, the in vivo function of genes for which uh, very, very little uh, is known. All right, Poppy, let's go on to the next slide. So a few things about uh, workshop etiquette that I'd like to go over. Uh, for During the presentations, we really kindly ask you to mute your microphones, uh, mute your audio. Um, it's up to you whether you want to uh, continue your uh, video. Uh, either way is fine. As far as questions, um, hold your questions until after each presentation. You can enter during the presentation, you can certainly enter your questions into the chat or at the end of each presentation, uh, raise your hand using the uh, raise hand function on your in your Zoom and we'll then get to you. Uh, that'll go on for about five, 10 minutes or so after each presentation. And then at the very end, we'll have a final discussion session lasting about 30 minutes. If you have any connection issues, uh, please uh, contact Poppy at the address shown on the screen. Thank you, thank you, J.K. And, and again, thank you, thank you, Dr. Kim. It's it's late now in Seoul. It's getting to almost 11 at night, 11 p.m. at night, 2,300 hours. And we're going to move now to uh, Pune uh, in India uh, with Dr. Nixon Abraham, where it's um, closing in on. Um, uh, I think around 7 p.m., if I'm right, 1900 hours. So first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Abraham here and his PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg, Germany, followed by a postdoc at the University of Heidelberg and a University of Geneva. In 2015, Dr. Abraham started his lab at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Pune, where today he is an associate professor. He and his Team conduct translational research studies on olfactory information processing and decision making using multiple approaches in mice, including molecular biology, automated behavioral training, and optogenetic neural control. His research also involves human olfactory perception in patients with olfactory dysfunction. Dr. Abraham has won several awards for his excellent research contributions, including the Ruprecht Karras Prize in 2008, 
the Joaquim Seibenecker Promotions Prize in 2008, an EMBO Fellowship, Pfizer Research Prize, the Radbo Excellence Fellowship, and the Welcome DBT Intermediate and Senior Fellowships. So we're really, really very, very pleased and happy to have Dr. Abraham with us today. Um, the title of his talk is Olfactory Representation in Health and Disease from Circuits to Behavior. So Dr. Abraham, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. OK, OK. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Lloyd, uh, for the introduction. And I really thank uh, Professor Lloyd and uh, uh, Professor Seong for organizing this workshop. Uh, we have become the member of IMPZ uh, not so long ago. and. Um, I, and I started to attend uh, the uh, work, work group meetings uh, very recently. Therefore, uh, we don't have any, uh, any data from any uh, uh, knockout animals yet. Um, uh, because of that, I would like to present what we are doing. And by presenting what we are doing in the lab, I hope uh, you guys will get an idea about what all things we can offer from our side. Um, uh, let me uh, start my talk. So the title of the talk is Olfactory Representation in Health and Disease from Circuits and Behavior. And uh, let me start uh, by thanking all the students uh, who have involved in different projects. Um, uh, we started in 2015, and three PhD students have already graduated who are doing their postdoctoral studies. And uh, the uh, mm, focus of the lab is olfactory perception and decision making. And uh, we have different projects running in the lab looking at different aspects of olfaction. And today, uh, I would like to focus on the rodent models of olfactory dysfunctions. Although we don't have any uh, uh, knockout models, uh, we try to generate the models using the wild type by using different strategies to address different questions. So I would, um, I would give you two examples for that. Um, with that, let me start the talk. So if you look at uh, I mean, uh, the history of uh, olfactory neuroscience, uh, I think olfactory neuroscience is now super important because of COVID-19. And uh, olfaction was one of the uh, senses that was really discussed a lot uh, when the COVID uh, start, uh, started because of all the problems, olfactory problems that we had. And um, there were a lot of reports um, about the anosmia and hyposmia, parosmia, so on and so forth uh, from different parts of the world. And we still uh, continue to struggle with the sensory and cognitive dysfunctions in long COVID. And uh, when you want to study uh, any sensory system at a uh, systems level, you can, you can start from molecule and then go up to behavior level. And you know, when you go from molecules to the behavior level, the complexity increases. You can study at a single synapse level or at a single neuron level or at the network level. And when you have new disorders or new diseases with some you know, unknown uh, mechanisms, uh, how do you approach those kind of uh, disorders? And how do you find out the circuits that are responsible for that kind of uh, disorders. And for that, you have to collect the information, whatever the information that you can get from the clinics. And then according to the those uh, clinical observations, you have to come up with the uh, any animal model, mostly the rodent models. Right? And in the lab, we always go in the opposite direction. We start with the behavior and then 
if you uh, if we see a clear phenotype, then we go back and then study the circuit mechanism. The advantage is, you know, if you have a behavior phenotype, for sure you will be able to find out the circuit mechanism. Um, and if you go from, for example, from a, a single synapse level, you study it at a single synapse level, it's not always guaranteed that you will end up in getting a behavior phenotype. So therefore, I think for a complete study, uh, going in the reverse direction is always advantages uh, from our uh, experience. And the, uh, this is how the olfaction works. So the order molecules are, we are surrounded by the order molecules. And when we inhale, the order molecules are getting inside the, uh, inside the nose. And inside the nose, we have the olfactory sensory neuron sitting. And these orders are going and binding to the order receptors on the olfactory sensory neurons, which will activate the olfactory sensory neurons. And they fire the action potentials. And these action potentials then travel to the olfactory bulb and then convey the information to the next level uh, of neurons, which are the projection neurons of the olfactory bulb, the mitral and tufted cells. And the information processing through the mitral and tufted cells are heavily modulated by the inhibitory network that you see here. And this inhibitory network is acting at two different levels. One is at the center core of the olfactory bulb, they are called glanin cells. And they are also, the inhibitory neurons are also there uh, among the glomeruli. Uh, they are mostly the periglomerular interneurons. And both these are mostly the gabagic uh, interneurons. And after this refinement, the information further travels to the higher centers. And when it reaches the cortical areas, we perceive what we smell. And this is how the olfaction works. And if you look in the, uh, in the rodent olfactory system, um, the anatomical organization is very similar. What you see here is half of a mouse head and the olfactory sensory neurons are sitting here in the, uh, on the turbinates. And, and from there, they project to the olfactory bulb. What you see here, the olfactory, this part, this part and from the olfactory bulb, it goes to the um, olfactory cortical areas. And this is the uh, uh, real picture of uh, the microscopic picture of the olfactory sensory neurons um, uh, expressing uh, GFP. And it, it, when you look at the coding, uh, how the coding works in the, um, in the olfactory system, uh, the uh, olfactory sensory neurons, they, always, uh, they express only one receptor type. There are some exceptions. Uh, if you look at the uh, paper, some paper that was published from Robert Sandeep that has uh, lab um, years back. He is reporting uh, um, the olfactory sensory neurons in, uh, at specific locations, which can express more than one receptor. And uh, otherwise, uh, one receptor, one neuron is, uh, uh, th that rule is always applicable. And um, one order can activate many different types of receptors. And one receptor can be activated by many different smells. So therefore, it is always a combinatorial coding uh, that happens in the olfactory system. And because of that, the order space is extremely complex. Um, I'm sure that uh, you guys have seen the science paper where they reported that humans can uh, uh, dismate more than one trillion orders. Um, although uh, some uh, debate is happening uh, in uh, the related to the findings of that, uh, that paper. But still, I think it is, it is a lot of uh, order molecules that uh, the human olfactory system can detect and discriminate. And I, 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 as you know, the uh, Linda Buck and Richard Axel uh, won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the order receptors and for the organization of the uh, olfactory system. And if you look inside the olfactory bulb, so this is a cross section of the rodent olfactory bulb, you see this beautiful layered structure in the olfactory bulb. So in the outermost layer, you can see these uh, uh, circular structures are the uh, nerve endings of the, uh, the olfactory sensory neurons, which are known as the glomeruli. 
And here you see the, the mitral cell layer, the cell bodies of the projection neurons are lying in these cells. And this layer is known as the external plexiform layer. A lot of inner neurons are present here. And uh, the innermost layer is the granule cell layer, which are the garbagic uh, inhibitory inner neurons. And, um, and the, one of the advantage of using the olfactory system is uh, as it has this beautiful layered structure, using different strategies. For example, if you think of the stereotaxic uh, uh, surgeries, you can really target different layers and you can try to modulate the functions of uh, different cell types or the different cell layers. So that is possible. And uh, the olfactory bulb is, in rodents, the olfactory bulb is very uh, accessible. And uh, they, in between the, they, they lie in between the eyes and you uh, cut the skin and uh, open the, uh, open the um, cranium and you are right over there. And um, th therefore you can do a lot of, uh, as, uh, um, as we explained in the previous talk, you can do a lot of experiments. You can record uh, the electrical activity. You can do the imaging and uh, while the animals are behaving. And therefore I think olfactory system is uh, is a, a very attractive sensory system to study uh, in general how the brain functions. And another complexity of the olfaction is the multimodality that is involved. Uh, in this movie, you see that the uh, CT scan of a olfactory epithelium. And uh, here is the cross section. And uh, you know, the olfactory receptor neurons are sitting uh, in, this, in this olfactory epithelium. And uh, as you know, we humans, as well as the rodents, modulate our breathing when we try to smell something. And there is always the airflow information associated with the chemical information. And we don't know. There are two papers saying that the OSNs are olfactory sensory neurons are mechanosensitive. And we have also some data now proving that the rodent olfactory system can also detect the mechanical sensation and behavior, uh, the behavior quantification is also possible. And the olfactory bulb is also uh, processing this uh, mechano uh, sensation uh, and the related stimuli. And because of that, how the mechano sensation can alter the olfactory per perception, so that is completely unknown. And uh, the rodent nose can also sense the temperature. And therefore, you know, it, it is really acting as a multimodal organ. So it can detect the mechanical sense, uh, mechanical stimuli, and then the thermal stimuli, as well as the chemical stimuli. But this multimodality is uh, mostly, I would say, mostly unexplored. I think that's, a, therefore, it, it's a good topic to get in and to uh, do a lot of uh, things. And if you want to study uh, any brain functions from the circuit to the behavior level, you need to have a combination of techniques. For example, here what you see uh, is the in vivo calcium imaging that we did from the olfactory bulb while the uh, animals were actively behaving. And uh, you have to have uh, um, uh, the behavioral assays here, what you see here is a, a go no go operating condition paradigm. It's completely automated. The animal is uh, uh, walking around in the training chamber. And when the animal pops the head in this small hole, uh, then the order initiation happens. It's completely automated. There is an infrared beam uh, and then a the detector. Therefore, the, when the animal pops the head, the beam breaks, that activates the opening of the uh, or the bulb, and then the animal receives uh, different types of orders, and we always train them to differentiate a rewarded order and a non-rewarded order. For example, this one is a uh, rewarded order. You can see the animal is uh, staying there and doing something. What it does when it receives a rewarded order, it clicks on the water delivery tube in order to get a water reward at the end of the stimulus. And for a non-rewarded order, um, I hope there will be one more non-divided order. And uh, when the animal receives a non-divided order, the next one is a non-divided order. You can see the difference in the, in the behavior. So this is a well-trained animal. The animal just poked uh, the uh, nose and then they, it, uh, it retracted the uh, nose, uh, the head very fast in this case for a, uh, a non-divided order. Therefore, when you, uh, when you record the uh, behavioral readouts, let's say with the millisecond precision, 
you can uh, uh, try to uh, hold different types of parameters, for example, how quickly the animals can learn and uh, how much time the animals takes to discriminate between different orders and, um, and how much it's in memory. And all these parameters we can uh, um, find out to use in this context of behavior analysis. And if you want to study the causality between the circuits and the behaviors, then you have to go for the uh, experiments like the in vivo imaging or the optogenetics here. Uh, this is a channel rhodopsin expressing animal. When the blue light is uh, flashing, the, uh, uh, the channel rhodopsin is in action and uh, the, the, protein, the channel protein, uh, when the channel protein, protein is in action, the channel opens and then the uh, cation influx is happening. Whereas uh, in case of a inhibitory rhodopsin, uh, when the orange light is flashing, it's an archaeorhodopsin, it's, uh, it's a proton pump. When the orange light is flashing, again, the channel opens and it allows the efflux of the protons. Therefore, it hyperpolarizes the uh, neuron in this case. Whereas in case uh, by flashing the light, either you can make the cells firing the action potential or you can suppress the action potential firing. Um, and therefore, you can also see the immediate effect that may happen because of this modulation in the behavioral results. And um, uh, with all these uh, um, uh, techniques, we uh, started the lab uh, in 2015, and the first paper came out in 2019 in cell reports, where we uh, reported um, uh, the correlation between the olfactory discrimination time and the complexity of the order maps that uh, we were recording from the olfactory bulb. So when you have, for example, when you have two simple stimuli, you take two different esters. Uh, here, this is the ethyl butyrate and uh, here, this is a amyl acetate. These are the different orders that we have used. And you can see the activated glomeri in response to these orders. Uh, if you quantify these activated glomeri, they are very different. But if you mix these two different orders, you take 60% of this order plus 40% of this one versus the other way around, you can see very overlapping pattern here. And uh, uh, that means the complexity increases. And what we found here was by using the different classes of uh, uh, chemicals, when the complexity increases, the animal is taking longer and longer time to discriminate. The, that was one of the uh, findings from the, uh, that we reported in this uh, in this paper. And we can also record how how they sniff uh, when they actively involved in the behavioral task. What you see here is these are the onset of uh, inhalations. And uh, you can see the inhalation is increasing when they take the decisions. This is a decision making window, uh, uh, which is uh, which is uh, which you see here in the in the red shaded uh, area. And they they try to sniff a lot when they make the decisions, but their sniffing behavior behavior is independent of the complexity of the task that they are challenged with. So these were the findings uh, that we reported in this paper. And um, uh, to explain how olfaction can be used to study different disease conditions, um, uh, I will show you uh, two examples. Uh, in this example, um, we were trying to study uh, how the olfaction is altered in an animal model for the Parkinson disease. As we didn't have any genetic model, we decided to go for uh, the wild type animals. But what we did here is, we generated the alpha synuclein aggregates. And then here you can see the, these are the oligomers uh, and these are the fibrils. Um, and by using um, different methods, you can generate this in dish. And finally, you can inject these uh, different forms in the olfactory bulb. And we have already published a paper uh, where we have reported the optimized coordinates to target different cell layers in the, in the olfactory bulb. We were targeting in here the inhibitory in the neurons, the granule cells. And what we did in this uh, project, we injected these oligomers and, and the fibrils as well as the monomers in different groups of animals. And what we uh, observed was when we trained the animals after we injected, um, we uh, waited for their recovery, and then we started with different uh, different olfactory behavioral training. 
And what we observed was in the oligomer injected animals, the animals showed uh, the lowest learning phase, the slowest phase, and uh, and compared to the fibrils and the uh, monomer injected ones. And when we uh, uh, measured the reaction times, which are the olfactory discrimination time, there is a time that is taken by the animals to discriminate uh, between a rewarded and a non-rewarded stimuli. You can see in uh, in case of oligomer injected animals, they were the slowest compared to the fibril injected, fibrils injected, and the monomers injected. Mm -hmm. And uh, this behavior phenotype, when we had this behavior phenotypes, we asked the question: So, what is happening uh, when you uh, incubate uh, the uh, neurons, or when you inject the neurons in the um, in the olfactory bulb? Uh, sorry, these movies are not functioning. Uh, but uh, I will just explain. So, what we did here. Uh, was we cultured the olfactory bulb neurons and then we incubated uh, these uh, primary neurons with the different forms of the uh, alpha synuclein monomers, fibrils, and oligomers. And then we did the live imaging and then we quantified the neurite collapse, what you see here uh, in this graph. Uh, in case of oligomers, you see the neurite collapse is happening. Uh, um, with uh, the fastest speed, uh, followed by five bills, and whereas the uh, monomers, we don't see that kind of uh, neurite collapse, uh, the drastic ne ne neurite collapse that we observed as we observed in case of oligomers and five bills. So this uh, this can explain the behavior phenotype uh, uh, that we have observed. Um, uh, we we are trying to continue this project by uh, recording. Uh, and the olfactory bulb, we don't know when we will have more complete story uh, um, with this topic. And uh, the second story is, okay, uh, uh, th th this is um, uh, published already. This was published uh, very recently in uh, Molecular Psychiatry. What we uh, studied here uh, was how olfactory perception is varying in an um, uh, in uh, animal model for the early life stress. Um, it's not very complex to generate this animal model. What you do uh, here is uh, you uh, separate the pups from the, uh, uh, from the mother at an early, uh, early stage. Usually you keep uh, the pups with the mother for uh, more than three weeks. Uh, if you separate them uh, at two weeks, um, then you can claim that they are uh, they can act as a uh, animal model to study the early life stress. And uh, um, if you take care of the animals very well, they survive. All of them they survive. And then when they are adults, you can start with the behavior phenotyping. That's what we did here. We trained them for different types of order discriminations and uh, the simple order discriminations as well as the complex order discriminations. And in all order discriminations, what we observed was the Early life stress animals, were, their, their learning pace was significantly reduced compared to the control animals. And when we measured the memory, the memory was also compromised uh, with the uh, early uh, life stress animals. And as we were interested in the olfactory specific phenotype, what we did uh, here, using the early life stress animal, we did uh, the other types of behavior. For example, here, we did the buried uh, food pellet test where the animal is challenged to find the, the hidden uh, food pellet. And we did not observe any difference between the control animals and the ELS animals. That shows that their detection is intact. There are no problems at the detection level. And we also did the novel ob object recognition test. And, uh, and when we compared the behavior readouts between the control and the ELS animals, again, we did not see any difference between the control and the uh, early stress animals. So that, that proves that whatever the phenotype that we observe here is really the olfactory specific phenotype. And, uh, and then we, uh, we wanted to uh, go back and, and to uh, investigate the circuit that is involved in this uh, in the deficit that we observed, and we took the olfactory bulb from the control animals as well as from the early stress animal, and then we did the C4 staining, which is a, a neuronal activity marker. And what we observed was we did uh, we did observe a reduced number of neurons in the external plexiform layer, and in the external plexiform layer, 
Um, there are a lot of somatostatin expressing GABAergic in the neurons present. And as you know, the somatostatin has been shown to have some anxiolytic effect in, in the higher brain areas. Therefore, we focused on the uh, uh, on this specific type of uh, uh, interneurons, the somatostatin releasing in the neurons. And we also looked at their branching pattern. And what we observed was when we compared the early digestive animal with the control animals, their branching was significantly reduced. And the number is reduced and the branching pattern is reduced. And uh, with that, um, we can expect, so there might be some uh, difference, uh, differences at the, uh, the physiological level. And to uh, quantify that, we did this uh, microendoscopic imaging using this tubular lens implanted in the olfactory bulb. Um, we did the G-CAMP imaging uh, when the animals were trained to discriminate uh, different orders. And we were imaging at different uh, phases of the uh, uh, learning. And what we observed was when they, at the beginning of the uh, learning, when they are performing at the chance level, you can quantify the calcium amplitude uh, in these uh, uh, somatostatin in the neurons. The DCAMP was specifically uh, expressed in the somatostatin positive in the neurons. And as they learn to discriminate, you do see a decrease in the amplitude that shows there is a there is some kind of refinement that happens as the animals learn. And when we did the same experiment using the early digestive animal, we can see that this refinement was uh, gone in the in case of uh, early digestive animals compared to the control animals. So therefore, um, you can clearly see that the physiology of the somatostatin positive in the neurons are getting altered because of the early digestive induced by the early uh, maternal separation. So now uh, what happens? So these are the uh, interneurons that are making synapses with the projection neurons of the olfactory bulb, which are the mitral and tufted cells. As they are garbagic interneurons, you can expect to see some differences if, as their physiology is altered. And if you quantify the synaptic inhibition, you can expect to see some difference in the synaptic inhibition if they are synaptically connected. Uh, we uh, we had to do this experiment because uh, you know, the synaptic connectivity between the somatostatin positive in the neurons and the projection neurons are not very well studied when we when we were doing these experiments and therefore we had to do this experiments so you patch the mitral cell and then you inject some currents and then you make the cells firing the action potential and then this after hypopolarization reflect the synaptic inhibitory feedback on the mitral and uh, my, uh, mitral and tufted cells the projection neurons we were patching mostly the uh, the uh, mitral cells here and when we quantified the synaptic inhibitory feedback Compared to the control condition, you can see there is a significant reduction uh, for the uh, early life stress animal. And the amplitude was different and also the uh, uh, decay time constant was also reduced uh, with the early life stress animal. And now uh, to uh, establish the causality, you, can, you have to uh, try to do different experiments um, including the optogenetics. What we did here was first we had we had to prove that by using the optogenetics you can really alter the synaptic release. So we took the uh, olfactory bulb slices and we flashed the light and then we quantified by flashing the light. Uh, these uh, these uh, animals were expressing the channel rhodopsin in the somatostatin uh, positive interneurons. Therefore, when you flash the light the neuron should be active and they should release the somatostatin as well as the GABA, which is a neurotransmitter. And we focused only on the functioning of the uh, neurotransmitter because it is really difficult to separate, uh, separate out the action of the neurotransmitter versus the neuropeptide. And, uh, but we could prove that by flashing the light, the, anim the uh, cells are in action and they release uh, both GABA as well as the somatostatin. And if this is happening, you take the olfactory bulb slices where you did see the reduction in the synaptic inhibitory feedback and uh, you patch the mitral cell and then you record the uh, inhibitory feedback, then uh, you, can, you, you can get the parameters um, quantified. And then by keeping the patch intact, you flash the light and see if you can rescue 
the deficit. This is exactly what we could uh, uh, observe by flashing the light. We could rescue the deficit that we observed in the synaptic inhibitory feedback. So that establishes the synaptic connectivity between uh, the uh, inhibitory interneurons and the projection uh, projection neurons. Now, to complete the story, you have to do the uh, behavioral uh, assays. So uh, these animals, we had uh, different groups of animals. Where in one group of animals, we had the channel adoption uh, expressing in the in the synaptic interneurons. And if you take the early stressed animal, and if you don't activate your, uh, the channel reduction, you do see this uh, the uh, uh, compromised learning. And then you take the same animals and you flash the light, then you can rescue this uh, learning deficit here. And whereas if you take the other group of neurons where the uh, RQ reduction is expressed, um, you, you can have different groups again. You can express the RQ reduction in the control animal, in the wild type animal, and if you activate the RQ reduction, because as it is going to hyperpolarize the neurons, you would expect to see an you know, uh, opposite phenotype. And as the, they are the wild type animal, when uh, there is no light stimulation, they behave normally. And in the presence of light stimulation, you can see their learning is uh, getting compromised. Uh -huh. And you take the early life stressed animal, and uh, and then you further push down the system by activating the after reduction, and then there is no learning at all. So this bidirectional modulation of the behavioral phenotype, uh, you know, it confirms the causality between the somatostatin expressing in the neurons and the uh, the learning deficit uh, that was caused uh, by the uh, early early life stress conditions. So that's um, these are the uh, summary. Uh, from this paper, and we have already published this paper. And uh, here is a summary figure. By using a multi pronged experimental approach, we could really dissect out the neural circuit that was uh, responsible uh, for the adverse effects of the early uh, life stress. And uh, I will stop uh, in, uh, I'll take two, three minutes more. You know, here uh, in the lab, we are also trying to do uh, the um, olfactory. And behavior studies with uh, human subjects, and we started uh, this with uh, the COVID uh, during the COVID nineteen. We built built an olfactory action meter, uh, yeah, which is uh, now granted with the uh, Indian as well as the US patents, and we are uh, we are hoping to take this uh, instrument to the next level. And we have published a uh, few papers using this instrument, and what we have shown already by using different uh, classes of orders. You, in this specific work, we use 10 different orders uh, that are varying um, uh, with the varying of physical chemical properties. And you can detect, uh, you can quantify the olfactory detection abilities of the human subjects. You can quantify the olfactory matching abilities where the olfactory working memory is involved. And all these uh, quantifications are possible with the instrument. And with the COVID-19 subjects, what we observe was if you quantify the threshold levels uh, in the control subjects uh, versus the, uh, the COVID-19 patients, uh, the, in the COVID-19 patients, their threshold was significantly reduced. And if you take the patients which are, uh, uh, which are normal in detecting different orders, and if you challenge the patients uh, with the olfactory matching uh, test, you can see their olfactory matching abilities were compromised compared to the uh, the, uh, the normal subjects. And we continue. We are continuing this work. Recently, we also published this work using the long COVID subject. We uh, we were lucky to get few subjects uh, who were recovered from COVID. You know, uh, uh, many of them were almost one year after the recovery, but still we could see some. Uh, compromised olfactory matching ability. So that means we have to be very uh, uh, careful with our uh, cognitive functions, um, um, you know, uh, in the post-COVID era. So that's uh, that's a takeaway message uh, from this one. And now, when you have this kind of observations, uh, uh, how do you study uh, at the circuit level? How do you study the uh, neural mechanisms? You have to go go to uh, the um, uh, the animal models. So this was the only animal model uh, that we uh, we managed to generate in Isaac. So this is an H2 knockout animal. 
and uh, this paper was published last year where we did the uh, behavioral phenotyping as well as the morphological characterization. Uh, we could see the morphological aberrations in the in the olfactory bulb as well as in the olfactory epithelium of the uh, olfactory the, in the H2 knockout compared to the control animals. And when we quantified the behavioral readouts, we could see the deficits uh, in their uh, detection uh, abilities. And, um, and now as we have all these observations, uh, we are trying to also study the olfactory working memory using these H2 knockout animals. And that work is uh, uh, ongoing in the lab. And uh, this is where we are standing right now. And uh, let me thank once again, uh, all the students who have contributed to different projects in the lab and all my collaborators and, um, and, and the different funding agencies uh, who are funding my research here, uh, especially the welcome, uh, welcome DDT. Without uh, their support, uh, I don't think I would have been able to set up the lab and do this kind of experiments uh, uh, in India. And um, uh, we are um, very open and we are very happy to take uh, any assignments uh, from IMPC. And it would be great to get the animal, uh, the uh, different uh, animal models um, to do the detailed behavior phenotyping using our custom built uh, instrumentation. And I thank once again uh, for listening and I'm happy to take uh, any questions now. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Abraham. That was a fabulous, fabulous talk. They will, we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. Just um, either type your question in the chat or raise your hand. And I, I see the first one from Dr. Holter. Sabine, go ahead. Thank you very much, um, Nixon, for such a fantastic um, presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. My, my laptop broke down on me this morning. So I'm on my phone. <laughs> um, so um, I was really impressed with this broad array um, of, of methods and, and um, approaches that, that you showed. And if I may, I would like to ask two questions. So the, the first one is, is more general. Um, going forward from, from where you stand after you set, you know, started all this and set this up, where do you think your research will have the most impact? Okay, so what, uh, I mean, uh, in the context of IMPC or in general? In general. In general. Okay, so um, I'm interested in the neural circuit mechanisms in general and uh, with the different disease models uh, and now uh, sort of getting more and more interested in studying the circuit mechanisms uh, with the different uh, animal models. Mm -hmm. uh, th these were two examples that we started with. Uh, and in terms of the olfactory perception, how olfactory perception work, uh, we have a lot of information already. Um, uh, having said that, uh, another interest uh, or another direction of the lab is uh, looking at the multi-modality involved in the olfactory perception and uh, uh, the paper is in communication where we are proving that the rodents, uh, rodent nose can really detect and discriminate different air flow rates. And uh, when I say that the, uh, the animals can detect and discriminate the air flow rates, the sniffing is getting more related and recently they will say, science paper published from Veronica Agus lab, and she is one of my collaborators, where they reported, you know, the spiking of mitral cell activity in response to the heartbeat. So I think um, uh, there we have a lot of uh, unknown questions, you know, how the changes, for example, how the changes in the intracranial pressure can modulate the olfactory perception or in general, the functioning of the brain. So I'm, uh, I'm focusing in that aspect also um, uh, in terms of the basic research, but of course, uh, all this basic research makes sense when we try to apply this in the animal models, because I think that is more rewarding for me because uh, you know, with the, uh, for example, with, with the April stress, uh, we were very happy to uh, pinpoint the circuit that was uh, getting affected because of the April stress. So uh, two directions in general, um, uh, for my lab. One is the, the uh, basic uh, the principles of olfactory perception 
um, focusing on the multi modality and then applying this in uh, different uh, different disease models where your faction is compromised. Okay, so yeah, but if you're focused on the basic research that you know whatever you find there, or you know you that makes it probably applicable to many different disease areas where olfaction plays a role, right? You you start with early life stress, or, or maybe look at um, yeah, but you could apply this to also other diseases where olfactory function. Absolutely, absolutely. Is this is what okay. I wish for. I mean, okay, if, okay. If I, if I have the access to different. Uh, animal models, uh, as I said, I can uh, do a lot of phenotyping with this uh, custom built instrumentation because these are, okay. you know, the precise behavior results which may not be possible with the instruments that we buy from the market, for example. And here we have a uh, high uh, temple precision. I can get the behavior read, read out in two millisecond precision, which is the uh, time of an action potential. And so uh, I think we have, a, we have an advantage. Uh, in that context, definitely. And if if, if uh, Kent, can I ask a second question? Yes, yes. Go ahead, Sabine. Okay, okay, okay. Um, uh, I'm I'm particularly interested in your early life stress results. Could you imagine using a different hello? Well, we may have lost Sabine. Um, let's give her let's give her a couple of seconds to see if she re re reconnects. Okay, looks looks like we may have lost her. She'll call, but but I do see we have another question from Dr. Siddiqui. So Azim, did you want to ask your questions? Go ahead and unmute, please. Uh, thank you, Professor. I'm actually a student, not a doctor. A master's student. So I have a question, uh, Professor. Can you go back to the slide of uh, neural behavior, uh, neural circuits and behavior? Um, which one? Uh, I, I there was a slide with the neural circuit and behavior. The headline. Ah, uh, the headline. Okay. So uh, this one. Uh, can you uh, see my screen now? Um, no, no, green again, Nixon. There you go. Yeah, uh, yeah. can you just stop me? Is, is this the slide that you're looking for? Uh, no, no, it, it starts with the heading, uh, neural circuits and behavior. Uh, this one, I think. Right. Yeah. Uh, can Can you explain the matter matter that you used in the in the blow picture? This one. Yeah. This yeah. One. This one. Okay. So here, um, what you see here is that uh, uh, the animal doing an olfactory uh, behavioral task. Uh, this is an olfactory discretion task, and uh, where uh, the uh, yeah, arcuorhodopsin is expressed in the in specific uh, uh, in the neuron types. Um, so when the orange light is uh, flashing, as I said, these are channel proteins that are taken from the microbes. Um, the archaeodopsin is from the arc bacteria. And you can, uh, using different genetic methods, you can express in specific subset of neurons. Um, uh, here we, are, we have focused on the uh, GAD65 expression GABA gene in the neurons. And when the light is flashing, what happens? The protons, the channels are opening, and this would allow the protons to go out of the neurons which would hyperpodize the membrane. And if the cell is firing an action potential in response to any stimulus, and if you flash this orange light, then the firing will be reduced or stopped. Whereas in this case, um, this one, this is the, uh, the, uh, the neurons expressing the channel rhodopsin protein. So the channel rhodopsin uh, protein is taken from the green algae and uh, Using the genetic methods, you can express it anywhere in the rodent brain. Um, what happens when the blue light is flashing? Uh, these channels are open, and then it allows the cations to get into the cells. Uh, as the cations are entering into the neurons, this would depolarize the membrane, and uh, then makes the cell firing the action potential. And therefore, you know you have this bidirectional modification. Using the channel reduction, you can make the cells firing the action potential. And using the RP reduction, you can uh, suppress the action potential. Uh, 
uh, generation. Uh, thank so you for great. explaining. I think uh, you have uh, mentioned a lot of interesting uh, methods, and I will be uh, I will much appreciate if I can email you to ask about different methods that you have explained in your presentation. If it's if I can email you. Sure, no problem. Yeah, we can talk. Thank you so much. Yeah. Right, thank th thank you, Azim. Good with your studies. So I think. Um, is if there are no more questions, I think we will. I'll turn it back to JK. Uh, yeah. Our next speaker. Thank you, JK. And thank you, Dr. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Okay. I'd like to introduce next speaker, Sibia Mendeler. He's a currently senior researcher in behavioral neuroscience lab. CNR, National Research Council, Institute of Biochemistry and Cell Biology, Monterotondo, Italy. Also, he's a faculty at uh, Sapienza University in Rome. Uh, he got a, her BS from Natural Science at University La Sapienza, Rome. And her, she got her, her PhD from Top Two University, Boston. And her, he posted a fellow at University of Rome. Department of Genetics and Molecular Biology Psychological Lab. Uh, she was deeply involved in large scale European and worldwide project and consortia on mouse phenotyping, home cage monitoring, and lab animal science. Also, he, she focused on the study of motor and cognitive functions as well as social and emotional behavior by using automated systems and astrologically based direct observation. Yes, please give our hands to Sylvia. Yes, it's your time. Thank you, JK. I'm, I'm going to share my screen. It's very clear, you can start. Yes, you, you see it in presentation mode? Yes, we can see. Okay, thank you. I apologize if I need to shut off the camera in case the connection is not so good. Uh, anyway, thank you very much, uh, Kent and JK, for inviting me to uh, talk at, at this very interesting workshop. And thank you also to Poppy for organizing it. Uh, so I was lucky enough to be preceded by two experts in olfactory function, which I'm not. I'm an expert more in behavioral uh, studies. So this will be my perspective in, in the presentation that you will see. So I would like to start um, from some comparison across species to, to show you the importance on of these uh, olfactory and taste functions, so how important they are in other species other than us. So first of all, you may uh, remember how important it was the study about salmons and their homing behavior, uh, because they can find their uh, birthplace where they will go back when they need to reproduce. And this was one of the most important studies about odors and fish and so, the, the olfactory function is really important in fish. And then there is a picture of a, a model that is uh, often used in aging research. Then also insects have a very, um, olfactory function is in, in, in insects is also very important. And this was a recent study where they could uh, actually map some olfactory areas in the brain of a cockroach and they compare it to the somersal sensory cortex homunculus just to show how, in, how different there could be the representation of sensory um, functions in, in the brain. And this is also another picture that will emphasize the importance of the S1 somatosensory cortex in mice. This is our uh, subject of, of preference. Uh, this is not olfactory, of course, this is somatosensory cortex representation, S1, uh, com in compared with the, um, the, the, to the other parts of the body, just to show how important is the nose and the, 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 this part of the body for the mouse, because we all know it's a nocturnal animal and the olfaction 
and probably also touch because these are whiskers area uh, is also most crucial. And here again, a comparison between the olfactory epithelium in dogs, mice, and humans. And you can immediately see how uh, unimportant is olfaction for us, apparently. So, but because we study mice, uh, I would like to point out why uh, these functions are so important because they are highly, they, they um, are related to highly adaptive responses like feeding, exploration, spatial orientation. And this is also very important here in this study with, with this insect that where they could represent the spatial orientation of the animal uh, through odors. Uh, it's also very important uh, in uh, reproductive behaviors and mother offspring interaction, social interactions, learning and memory, and even individual recognition. So we, we should not neglect this function because we now know very well how important this is for the mice. And this function is being so important, they also have a great influence on other functions or other behaviors. So I will now move to what is the, the, um, the role of assessment of these functions in mouse phenotyping. So we, we all know now that chemical senses have a crucial role in the world of mice. And we, as uh, behavioral neuroscientists, we know this so well that we try to clean all possible odors in mice in our behavioral test because we, we don't want this interference. So we, we know this is important, but nevertheless, we don't study this enough. Despite the fact that we know that the dysfunctions in olfaction and tastes are highly relevant, as we have seen in the previous speakers, in the models of neurodegenerative diseases and even aging. Yet, as we are already have understood, olfaction and taste is, in mice especially, is incredibly neglected. And so we would like in this presentation, and probably I hope in the discussion at the end, to understand uh, the reasons why this is neglected. Uh, just to have an overview, I try to find some examples on uh, also to prove how neglected this is specifically in mouse phenotyping. So I did some very quick research on the mouse phenome database from Jackson Laboratory. And if you look for uh, the term olfactory or taste, you see that there are very few studies uh, reported. This is for inbred strains. And even in the aging related studies group, uh, there are many studies, but none of them were uh, um, focusing on olfactory or taste function. And also the, the, the procedures that they used, they were very simple procedures that I will show you later. Then when you look at the IMPC website, if you look for uh, taste and olfaction phenotype as an ontology term search, you will find the result that no pipeline or procedure is available as we all, or we all know. And for this, you if you look for phenotype, olfactory, or taste, you will not find almost anything apart from three entries that has to do with olfactory cortex morphology. And this is not surprising because we don't do this test, but nevertheless, the genes that we have in IMPC, uh, the mice that we have, and the possibility to generate mice uh, is, for, ex for example, uh, especially for olfactory or taste receptors uh, is very high. So we have many, many uh, lines that could be uh, requested. Uh, but with these lines, only a uh, few data on phenotype are available. And again, no data on either uh, olfaction or taste rele relevant phenotypes. So this is uh, the what you will see in my talk from now. So I will try to give you examples of mouse of an olfaction uh, uh, of, of mouse olfaction and taste assessment in uh, mice in the context of behavioral phenotyping in three in three projects that I was involved with uh, in my institute. One about neurodegenerative disease, another one about aging, and another and the last one very recent about the effects of pollutants as nanoplastic. Uh, we use very simple procedures, so nothing compared to what you have seen uh, previously with, with uh, Nixon, for example, or for uh, Chang Hoon. Uh, in our case, we use uh, 
procedures like the buried food pellet, habituation, dishabituation, order discrimination threshold, or two bottle preference tests. And I will tell you all the details about this. But the first question I had when we had to decide what type of procedures we wanted to use, uh, we had to consider what was our aim uh, using this test. And of course, you want to decide if you want just to have an idea of a, a simple uh, phenotype about the taste and olfaction function, or if you want, for example, to know if you are um, dealing with a complete loss of uh, taste or smell, or if, if you want to go in more details, uh, checking the olfactory acuity, for example, of your model, and then you have to deal with the sensitivity. So you have to decide the substance concentration and even the specificity, you have to decide what type of stimulus you want to use. And this is also true because, uh, because of the adaptive response that I was telling you about, the balance of the stimulus is very important. As you've seen previously, uh, it was shown that the, the fox the fox odor was uh, inducing a reaction of fear. So this is uh, probably a behavior that you didn't want to elicit. So that you have to choose the, the, the appropriate stimulus. Also, the fact that the odor or the the flavor you are using is edible or non-edible is also makes a difference. And also if it's from social or non-social uh, uh, origin is also important. I will try to show you all these procedures, some limitations, some advantages, and then I will conclude to uh, see if there is the feasibility and what is the relevance for IMPC. And we never have to forget what are the factors that are influencing the outcome of these tests. We've seen it already. For example, in many neurodegenerative diseases, you can be in the presence of motor deficits or other sensory de deficits. Then you have to consider sex of the subject, the hormonal and the social status. What is the motivation? What is the salience? What is the context you are doing the test? What is the previous experience of the animal? And of course, a, a very important factor is the age of the animal. So let's start with the first project. I will uh, show you some information about this. Uh, was a, a pro was a project uh, where I tried to combine two different studies. One was uh, um, was taking place in a, in in a lab where they were studying the effect of a, an overexpression of alpha synuclein, a protein that uh, is very important in the in models of Parkinson's disease because it was found accumulated in Lewis bodies. And then also another protein where we had uh, devoted a lot of time studying is a um, G protein couple receptor number 37 that was also found accumulated in Lewis bodies. The, uh, I decided to uh, put these two studies uh, together because in, in both studies we were dealing with uh, olfactory function, and we were trying to explain what that what could be the reason uh, there is an olfactory impairment since these two um, models are dealing with aspects of Parkinson's disease. In this case, this is a true model of Parkinson's disease because you see an accumulation of alpha synuclein specifically in dopaminergic neurons. And in this model, our um, hypothesis was it that it could be being knockout mice for this protein could be a model of neuroprotection. And I will show you some uh, procedure and data of these three different olfactory tests. The first test is the buried pellet test that measures the ability to detect and find palatable food. And I will show you a little video so you can see what is the behavior of the mouse. The, the important part of this test is that you have to food restrict the mouse to up to 90% of the initial body weight at least two days uh, before the test and also during the test. The test will last six days and the, the idea is to place one piece of sweet cereal, so a palatable food, uh, each day on a different position in a cage, in, a, in the cage below the, the bedding. And then you would measure the latency to dig up and eat the pellet. The, the cutoff is five minutes. And then on the last on the day after the test, you can even check uh, the latency to find the pellet if the pellet is visible. So to check if there is, if there is any other uh, impairment in, uh, in the mouse. And from these results of the paper 
uh, about the um, overexpression of alpha C nuclein, they could show that uh, the latency to uh, find the pellet was much higher in the transgenic mice compared to the wild types. And there was no difference, and the latency was very low when the pellet was visible. In our case, in our study, we didn't see such a difference, but we just saw a, um, probably a slower um, um, learning curve to detect the buried pellet in the knockout mice. But we, we mm, did not find any deficits or improvement in this test. The other test that we uh, perform and also the other study perform is the block test. The block test, uh, we use it to evaluate social order discrimination. So to compare uh, each mouse with his own order compared to non-self order. Um, the procedure uh, will uh, include uh, having five different uh, food blocks that are placed in the mouse cage. So the mouse will be housed with his cage mates and he will have uh, these blocks there for seven days without bedding change, seven days or 24 hours, depending on how much you want these blocks to be impregnated with the smell of the cage. And the, on the test day, uh, there will be three, uh, four trials. The, fir the first three trials, there will be the exposure for 60 seconds for each trial to the four blocks of his own cage. So blocks A, B, C, and D. On the last trial, then one of the block is substituted with the block E from a different mouse cage. So this will be a novel order. And these are the results of the experiment in both papers. Um, you see that if the block was, uh, if the the blocks were exposed for seven days, so it was a very strong smell on trial four, and these were male mice of three and four months of age. In both genotypes, there is the clear discrimination of the novel block compared to the other on scent blocks. So there is a significant discrimination, although the sniffing for the uh, novel block is much lower in the transgenic mice. When the, the, the block were exposed only for 24 hours, so there was a more subtle uh, exposure to the other, um, and the mice were, were older, in the wild type there is still a very strong discrimination, but in the, in the transgenic mice this discrimination is non-significant, and the sniffing is very low. In our case, we show kind of the opposite, although the results are not so clear as this one, because we see clearly that both genotypes will discriminate, both the wild type and knockouts will discriminate the novel scent in trial four. And this will be if the blocks were, uh, the, the animals were uh, younger and these were only female mice. And it was even uh, more clear that they could discriminate much better if the animals were older and the block were uh, in the cage only for 24 hours. So you see a clear discrimination for both genotypes. And the knockout mice were sniffing more. And the other important uh, data that I'm not showing is that the knockout showed also a shorter latency to contact the novel block on the first trial. Then the, the other test is the habituation dishabituation test. It's very common. This is a test that is uh, used very often to assess the detection of non-social odor and odor discrimination. And what we, we did in these studies is that the first you have to habituate the mouse to a small object. So we, it was used a, a plastic tissue cartridge, empty, that was placed in the cage for several days. And then the test day, this time the test is only one day long and seven trials. Um, you present uh, the animal with a cartridge that is filled with a piece of paper uh, with a drop with four microliter of either lemon for the first trials, trial one to six, and you expose the mouse for 30 seconds. And then on trial seven, you change the odor and you put a new scent that could be orange or lime in this case, and then we use other odors. What we try to uh, monitor here is the type, also the type of odor, because we tried at the beginning with uh, two very strong odors. One of each is highly palata palatable and is also as an edible um, value. Uh, 
uh, while we decided then to use more uh, subtle, subtle odors like peach and apricot that are uh, more subtle and they're similar. Like in this case, these are all citrus fruits, so there is, these are more similar odors. And here you see the results. And here I show you what, what we uh, mean by habituation. You see the yellow line is the decrease of sniffing behavior. If you see the wild type here in, in gray, the decrease in behavior from, y, uh, from, from trial one to six. So this is the habituation. And then you see at the dishabituation, well, you see an increase of sniffing behavior when the uh, odor is changed from lemon to orange. And the same happens from lemon to lime. But in this case, you see that there is no, there is no um, habituation. Sorry, there is no discrimination in the in the transgenic mice. And in this case, there is no habituation in the transgenic mice. So there, there was some, some difference to these no social orders. And what we observe here is that in our animal, there was a better uh, discrimination between the similar orders because here we see, uh, for example, in the, the aged animal, when the others are very uh, similar, that only the knockout could discriminate from trial four to trial five. So this is a long story just to show you that this test is easy to perform, but the results can be a little bit tricky to interpret. And these are also the considerations that we can uh, make about these for first three tests that I presented you. They are all inexpensive procedures, but it requires food restriction, for example, for the first test that I show you. They are time consuming. Sometimes it requires habituation to the new object. There are multiple trials and even multiple days of testing. The scoring uh, is difficult, it is usually manual and is not difficult to uh, define well what is sniffing behavior. There are different uh, approaches. Uh, the interpretation of the results is not always straightforward. There is a lot of influence on motor and motivation uh, deficits in case you have that problem. And that could be easy uh, when you have models of neurodegeneration. So uh, it could be a good way to measure olfactory capabilities, but it's not always good to measure acuity. So I would move to a second project. The second project was about aging. Um, we all know that there is an age-related sensory decline, and this project wanted to address this uh, with a convergent, method convergent methodology that integrates a large population and centenarians data uh, with omics and data and functional uh, omics data and functional uh, in vitro and in vivo uh, studies. This was funded by uh, the Italian Ministry of Research, and it was a project that involved many different universities in the entire peninsula from north to south. Uh, and our our group uh, was uh, responsible to validate. Uh, possible uh, factors linked to, to this sensory decline in aging uh, through the study of alteration and decline in these func uh, function and abilities, uh, all, all sensory functional abilities uh, in reference strains of mice and, and possibly in the future in uh, genetically uh, engineered mouse strains uh, of candidate genes that are involved in pathways of interest that emerge from this human studies. These studies conducted in, in centenarians and in fact shown the presence of allelic variants with opposite effects on sensory functions. Some allelic variants have a negative effect and predispose to the damage of the senses and others have a positive effect. These genes all emerge as potential candidates through the combined analysis, uh, offering valuable insight into genetic factors associated with 
longevity and sensory health. In particular, and this was presented recently to the European Human Genetic Conference in a poster, five of these genes, the one highlighted in, in black, have been associated with multisensory phenotypes for the, the functions of hearing, smell, and taste, and are implicated also in sensory signaling pathways. Then I, I looked for these genes in IMPC, and I found that uh, 12 out of 15 were listed. Uh, seven, 7 out of 15 have some phenotype data, and these are the ones where I placed the orange asterisks, uh, but only one of them had a I related phenotype. This is what we did in this project, and we are still uh, analyzing some of the data. We were uh, involved in the in vivo models of aging, uh, and we uh, validated and set up a platform, a multimodal integrated platform using CD1, so outbred mice, and C57 black six and mice, tested at various ages in independent groups. Uh, for this, um, six different uh, tests. The first, and, and of course, because these tests are very long and, and time consuming to perform, uh, we could not perform all the tests in the same animal. So there were two cohorts of mice. Uh, and so the first test, in the, I will only present you the data, of course, for olfactory and taste functions, but you have to remember that these two functions came after other tests that we had to deal with. Uh, social and tactile sensitivity. And then the second court was dedicated to um, vision and hearing functions. At the end of the, of the behavioral test, all animals were sacrificed and histological and molecular analysis were performed. So this is the olfactory and taste function that we assessed in both male and female of the two strains. Uh, we had a group of and uh, of 10 animals uh, per, per each uh, experimental group. So the total of mice was 120, because as I told you, we had three ages with independent groups of mice. Uh, and uh, our um, pipeline was organized uh, as such that we had a social and touch tests at the beginning. Then the mice were transferred to uh, our lab where we perform the odor habituation dishabituation test with a different procedure with all, that I will show you in a minute. Uh, and five mice were tested each day. And all this procedure for a court of 20 mice was lasting four days. Then all the 20 mice together could undergo the taste preference two bottle test that lasted 18 days. At the end, uh, all organ and tissues were collected. So this is the procedure for the odor habituation and dishabituation test. Um, the, the, the procedure involved the sniffing of a cotton swab that was soaked in a scent, and we decided to use non-edible odor, and we selected geraniol and citralva uh, that were diluted in mineral oil. And again, we measured the habituation, so the decrease in sniffing uh, over successive trials, and the dishabituation, the, the increase in sniffing or exploratory behavior when the novel order was presented. This is the timeline of the experiment, uh, and each mouse was exposed to this solution that were freshly prepared for each trial. The test duration for each mouse was about 30 minutes, because you see there is one minute exposure and then one minute of intra-trial interval. And I will go immediately to show you the data uh, that I dis the distinguish age by age. So the first two graphs are for the age of six months. You have males on the left, females on the right. And in white, you have the CD1 mice, and in black, black six and mice. You see here clearly the mineral oil. Then the mineral oil, we can also consider it also as an odor, because even though they have a, a higher sniffing time, because the, the cotton swab probably is a new object that they want to explore, but also mineral oil as an odor. So we see the habituation phase, then the dishabituation with, that we interpret as a discrimination of the new odor, the geraniol, uh, and then the dishabituation to geraniol and the discrimination of the new odor, citralba. You can see here that both, stra both, uh, both strains were clearly habituated, but 
uh, only CD1 were discriminating the new orders. In the females also, there is some difference, but in general, at six months, we can say that there is uh, a good habituation and discrimination uh, behavior. At 12 months, uh, the sniffing time is reduced in general, but again, the males uh, which discriminate both others um, and the female at, at 12 months, we see that there is a lack of habituation, for example, in both strains and only the CD1 strain were discriminating the new order. At 18 months, again, reduction of sniffing behavior, uh, but there is still discrimination in the males and uh, things starts to be more variable in females and also the, the number of mice, CD1 mice in females tends to be reduced because of uh, health problems and also some uh, behaviors that, that does exclude some animals. And this is the, the overview of the age effect. So just to show you that the total uh, time of sniffing decreases with age, and this is very clear for mineral oil in general. For citralva, it's not so clear, uh, especially uh, for the females here, uh, but also the male black six and there is no uh, age dependent uh, decrease of sniffing. But in general, this is the profile for, for aging. So these are some uh, example videos of this uh, test, just to show you some difference in the Two strains, the behavior, this is one male and this is a female at six months. Uh, the, the CD1 mice are much more uh, interacted with the, with the cotton swab, sometimes even too much. Then here there is a mouse that we had to exclude, exclude because of a high uh, circling behavior. And this is another model that it seems that is not moving, but is moving very slowly. A model that we tried, but we could not go on with the experiment because it's really hypoactive, probably uh, because of the uh, 129 background strain. So in general, the stiff thing, uh, we could conclude that is higher in CD1 compared to black six, that uh, the sniffing is uh, decreasing with age, especially oil and geraniol. Uh, the citralva is more uh, variable and also female uh, behavior is more variable. And then we have to note that 50% of uh, the CD1 female were excluded, especially at older ages. Uh, some conclusion is that this experiment is very time consuming. There are scoring difficulties. The choice of others can be also uh, discussed. And then we also always have to consider activity and motivation levels, and then uh, understand why females are more variable. One hypothesis is that the estrogen may have a role in this. Then we move to the taste preference test. This is the first time in this workshop we talk about taste. Um, I don't know why we, we try to measure this. Uh, the only problem with this procedure is very, very simple, but it's very, very long because if you want to, to, to assess different uh, tastes, so the sweet, the sour, the bitter, the salty, the, even the umami, uh, in this case, you need 18 days because you uh, will perform a, a two bottle preference test at 48 hours uh, um, intake. You will measure the intake of the two solution. The water is always compared to the taste and solution. And every 24 hours, you will switch the bottles because you want to avoid any uh, side preference. And then you need to have one day of rest between the presentation of the different solution. And also the order of the presentation of the solution is very important. You want to start with a palatable solution and then go to this that we assume is the least palatable. And then this conclude also with a very palatable solution. So these are the data all combined. This is the preference, uh, percentage of preference. At 50%, there is a line that indicates no preference. And this is true, for example, if you look at water, you see the both strains in males and females will show no preference, which is very good. So they, they will not uh, prefer one bottle other over the other because they are both water. Uh, and then the, the conclusion of this data is that mice of both strains, as it was expected, they prefer saccharin and also the monosodium glutamate, the umami taste over water and tend to avoid citric acid and kinane solution. Uh, here, CD1 uh, 
show always a higher preference than uh, black six. And the, the sodium chloride solution is sometimes equally preferred as water. These preferences are consistent across age, but then the preference tend to decline and the sex difference were not okay. significant. Uh, the, um, here is to show you what is the uh, total fluid intake in the 24 hours, just to show to see if there was a difference between ages. And we see that there is an increase in the intake of the fluid uh, when animals are, are older. This is probably also due because of the body weight is increasing, though they tend to drink more. And here again, CD1 drink more than black six. Uh, and also there is um, higher intake, for example, at, uh, at uh, 18 months, there is a higher intake in the sucrose solution over water, I mean, saccharin solution, and also uh, the sodium chloride solution and the monosodium glutamate solution was um, higher the intake at 12 months in general. So a consideration about these procedures Again, inexpensive. Maybe we can uh, avoid to use so many globes and so many cotton swabs because this uh, uh, test will be uh, producing an enormous amount of waste that is not very nice for the environment. Uh, it's very time consuming because it took us almost one month to complete 20 mice. Maybe we could restrict it to one or two taste stimuli. There is the problem of the odor diffusion, the problem of manual scoring, uh, the, the interpretation of the results, and then again, the influence of motor and motivation deficit. And for the taste test, there is also uh, some possible consequences of the post-ingestive post effect. And again, there is strain specificity. And now to the last project. The last project is a very recent project that we started in our institute. It's a very ambitious project. And I will present you some unpublished data that were taken from um, uh, the thesis of a very talented uh, master uh, degree student, Giorgio, with his uh, two advisors. Um, they devised an aerosol system. So again, very cheap aerosol system uh, inspired by this uh, paper. Uh, where they uh, could expose the, the mice to uh, nanoplastics uh, and mice were forced to, they were group housed and they were inhaling um, synthetic nanoplastics and these nanoplastics were uh, 100 nanometer uh, red fluorescence polystyrene nanoplastics, so they were uh, uh, very well characterized. And we could measure the biodistribution of the nanoplastic in many organs. Here I show you uh, ex vivo only the, the image for the brain um, through an imaging technique, the optical imaging computer, uh, computer tomography. Uh, and you can see that 24 hours after the exposure to the nanoplastics, there is a very high distribution of nanoplastic in the brain. And you can see clearly also in the olfactory bulb that will disappear seven days after exposure. And here you see the graphs, so 24 hours and seven days in red, the group exposed to nanoplastics. Uh, after exposure to nanoplastics, uh, um, they measured the effect both on respiratory and olfactory system. These are the tests that were performed. I will show you all, only some data from olfactory behavior and neuronal activation of olfactory bulb. For the olfactory task, they use the odor detection threshold task, again using cotton swabs, but this time the test was much shorter. Uh, the odorant that was selected was octanol, that has a citrus fruit smell, and it was presented in the own cage. And two uh, cotton swabs were presented. One was the control, the mineral oil, and the other one was the one soaked in the, in the um, uh, odor, octanol, and the test lasted three days, consecutive days, in which the, the concentration of the odorant was increased. And you can see here the graph, and they were measuring the percentage of sniffing of the octanol uh, stick compared to the mineral oil. And you see clearly that there was a clear discrimination in the control mice, but the, the, the mice exposed to the nanoplastic could not discriminate the octanol odor at this concentration. And not even at the highest concentration. And the total olfaction also was different in the control compared to the uh, mice exposed to the nanoplastics. 
And then to prove that there was an effect in the olfactory bulb, they measured the CFOS expression after the exposure to nanoplastic, to, uh, to nanoplastic and after the stimulus of a uh, much higher uh, concentration of octanol, 3% octanol, uh, in three five-minute sessions with five-minute interval in an empty cage. And then the animals were sacrificed uh, one hour after the stimulation. And uh, CFOS expression was measured in the olfactory bulb, as you see in the picture. And what they found is that when in the control animals, when the uh, the, um, the olfactory bulb is stimulated, you see an increase in CFOS positive cells. Uh, but when you uh, measure that in the animal exposed to nanoplastics in red, you don't see this similar uh, increase, although there is a difference between non-stimulated and stimulated animals. What you see in these other type of cells, also in the olfactory bulb, is that there is a complete absence of response to stimulation uh, in uh, in this olfactory bulb. So this is also a proof of what are the effects of nanoplastic on olfaction. Some consideration about this test is also inexpensive. You can use fewer gloves and cotton swab is, is shorter. It requires individual housing. Uh, and this time, it, this test could be good for olfactory acuity because you can test the sensitivity of the animal to different concentrations. Uh, there are some problems because sometimes the mouse will bury the stick or will move it. So this should be uh, taken into account. Of course, the, the position of the sticks were uh, changed every day, so not to have a bias for, for position. And here again, there are some influences for the scoring and the motivation deficit. So I will go to the conclusion. I hope to be on time. Uh, so as we have said over all this afternoon is the chemical senses have a crucial role, especially in the world of mice. Uh, we know that these functions in olfaction and taste are highly relevant in models of neurodegenerative diseases and aging. But, uh, and they stud their study uh, could help to understand mechanisms underlying neurodegeneration. They could be very useful as biomarker for early detection of pathology and could give us better insight into aging process linked to sensory decay. But still, they are very neglected. So this is my first question for the discussion that we will have uh, right after my presentation. Why are these uh, assessments so neglected? I have some ideas we can discuss later. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, limiting my consideration about the procedures that I presented. These are the only one I had experience with. Uh, the limitation of these procedures is that they are time consuming. There is a lack of control on over this volatile stimuli. The automation uh, could be complex to achieve uh, and the interpretation of the sniffing behavior that we measure in this test, it could be uh, difficult. There are some advantages, of course, they are inexpensive. Anybody can run these tests in their lab. They are non-invasive, which I think is very important. They they monitor, they try to model natural behaviors, and they also could give, get our, uh, closer or, or give us a better understanding of the mouse world that we tend to neglect so much. And here are some points that I would like to discuss with you in the discussion about the feasibility and relevance for IMPC, because I think that, I don't know if there will be uh, the opportunity to do this, but we should probably include olfactory and test function, function screening in the pipeline, maybe as a secondary or non-mandatory test. Uh, probably we could suggest some procedures that could be included in the impress and, and maybe work through um, some aspects that could render this procedure so more high throughput. And um, we could identify genes and pathways important for modeling neurodegenerative diseases, also sensory aging mechanism, and possibly also the impact of pollutants, as I show you, and also other factors, or as Nixon was showing, infectious diseases, for example. Uh, and then we should integrate uh, uh, this with other genes associated with neurodegeneration or even better psychiatric diseases, because also in many psychiatric diseases, these functions are um, uh, highly uh, important and altered. Uh, and then we could also combine this with other sensory function tests. 
And with this, I like to thank you all of you, to thank all of you for the attention. And then this is the acknowledgements for all, all the people that were involved in the three the projects. GPR. The GPR 37 project, the Sensing Sage Saging project, and the non-plastics project. Thank you very well, much. Well, thank you for your wonderful talk. And your talk included, I mean, very extensive area, <laughs> including all section. Is there, okay, Steve. Yeah. Good to see you here. <laughs> good, good to see you too, JK. And, and hi, Sylvia. Uh, thanks for your very, your very nice talk. And I, I, I wanted to ask a question to kick things off, but um, it doesn't relate so much to why are these tests so neglected, but I think that's an important point to discuss. And it may be worth remembering on that note that uh, way back in one of the career meetings, we did discuss about putting um, an olfactory test into the IMPC pipeline. And I think one of the issues that always came up was the time consuming nature of the test. Um, but that doesn't stop it from being a non mandatory test and making the procedures, the robust procedures, more widely available to labs across the world. But in terms, I think uh, looking at olfaction is a, can be a tremendous insight into biological processes. And I wanted to ask you a question about um, uh, the particular data that you had uh, on uh, dishabituation uh, comparing CD1 and black six mice. And I think it was very interesting that in the CD1 outbred mice, the disabituation was much more significant than, than in black six. And I, th I thought that was very interesting. And I, I wondered what your thoughts might be about that, because it seemed to suggest that that change in, uh, uh, if you like, olfactory ability between CD1 and black six could be down to genetic variation that is more uh, that is in the CD1 mice, but not in black six. Genetic variants that might, for example, lie in the odorant receptor genes themselves, or for that matter, perhaps in other genes around the genome that have an uh, impact upon olfactory ability. And I just wondered what you thought about that particular data, because I thought it's quite interesting that there was such a marked difference between CD1 and Black 6. Yes, uh, no, this is really, really interesting because, um, first of all, for, probably we have to consider the difference between outbred and inbred, first of all, and because they're different in many other behaviors. So I wouldn't um, specifically focus on their olfaction uh, function in this case, because also their motor behavior was very different. So this sniffing they were they were expressing was also influenced by their uh, much more exploratory drive and activity that they showed compared to the black six. Okay. Then also there was more variability for this problem because some mice were more exploratory, some were less. Um, I don't know if there was also, but this is just speculation, the fact that these mice are supposedly uh, having a, a lower uh, visual ability. Mm. And you could tell this, I mean, I, I cannot prove it with data, but looking at the videos, you could see that they were uh, sniffing more because they could not see the object. So mm. they were not pointing to the object, especially at an older age because they could not see the, this, this object and they, they were just uh, trying to find it and they, they sniffed more, much more. So I don't know if there is an interaction with their uh, other senses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, which is known to, because these are albino, sometimes they, they but I'm, I have no data to prove that. This is just speculation. So it's, and, it's, it's something to be cautious about in terms of interpreting olfactory abilities in terms of the pleiotropic effects of genes, perhaps on other systems. And like, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's why we are trying to see now combining with all the other uh, sensory modalities that we measure in the platform, if mm -hmm. we could see some similarities, some, some correlations, this could be important to, to prove. And also the... the the females in the CD1 strain were also more valuable, but I don't have a clear answer for that. But 
for sure is very important to to pursue these studies and thanks thanks Sylvia well I think you have some questions I think Dr Abraham has a question go ahead Nixon Right. Yeah, great talk, uh, Sylvia. Although you have written that uh, you know, there are some limitations uh, to interpret the sniffing, uh, when you uh, say that there is a reduction, um, the age dependent reduction, what do you think? Is it happening at the periphery level or is it going beyond the central periphery level? And just some speculation. Again, with this sniffing behavior, you can never exclude the motor component and the yeah. motivation component. So with this, I'm, I'm not so sure. And then we have to be very careful in defining what we call sniffing. Because sometimes you see just touching the object or maybe just directing the attention to the object. So that, that's why the interpretation is not so straightforward. Also, I was concerned when you see uh, there is an increase in sniffing. Is that because they uh, need more time to discriminate the other or not? This is something that always puzzled me. When, when they sniff more or less, is it because they um, cannot perceive very well, so they need more sniffing to discriminate mm. that other or not? Yeah, that's, that's you are the expert, yeah. so I will ask you. I, I'm just observing their behavior. And as I told you, there are differences in how they approach the, the object that they have to sniff. So, and it, it, as I was saying to Steve, it's also different the, the way they approach. Yeah, so uh, I mean, when the concentration decreases, uh, we do see some increase uh, in the uh, sniffing uh, in general. And yeah. we have seen this with that was so maybe, maybe it's too easy to say that if they sniff more they perceive more and if they sniff sniff less they perceive less. I'm not so yeah. convinced. And that that would also depend on the type of photos that we use. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. The, the type and of other is important also because of previous experience and the the, the the balance that they give to this order. Yeah. Yeah. And the other question, when you guys use the uh, the socially relevant orders, um, are you looking at, at the um, you know the activation level, um, the AOB versus the accessory or factive bulb versus the main or factive bulb? Or no, I didn't check any of those. No, that was just to prove that. If there is a deficit, it's not specific to a type of, of order for for his meaning for the mouse, because if it's mm. a social odor, could have a meaning, and if it's an uh, another odor, could have a different meaning. So there could be deficit in one part and not the other. Mm. Mm. But mm. that would involve other mechanisms in the brain that are not strictly uh, related only to olfactory system. There could be other systems involved and integrating the information yeah. also because the, this is, is, as you know olfactory function is so uh, prevalent in mice that there are so many interaction with other systems in the brain that is is difficult to dissect only olfactory with this type of behavioral tests mm -hmm. although both systems the main as well as the accessory systems are involved um, sometimes uh, towards the socially relevant orders the accessory Perfect system is more. Uh, is more yes. Yeah. yeah, but I I haven't performed the studies, but yeah. you may know more. And and you have a very nice system also to control the odor very well and to yeah know yeah. very well where, where where is going, what is doing. So thank you. Well, any other questions? Well, JK, I wonder if it might be a good idea. We know we have, um, I mean, we have a good number of people on the line. Um, mm -hmm. We have also several members of the IMPC, which is great. But I, it might be 
good if we could get some of the attendees who are not part of the IMPC to give us their <laughs> thoughts and opinion. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start it off by saying, you know, I, yep. this has been a fabulous uh, series of, of lectures, so I really appreciate uh, all of our speakers today. Um, with regard to uh, Sylvia's uh, question uh, and the challenge to the IMPC, um, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to present it very as, as simply as I can. We have thousands of genes, mm -hmm. um, and in one bucket there are olfactory and taste, so gustation and olfactory genes. About 50 gustation genes, about 350 olfactory genes. Now these, when I'm calling that, I'm calling like the taste receptors and the olfactory receptors, and then there's all these other genes. Okay. And then in terms of the phenotyping, there's all the behavioral, cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, all the phenotyping you do, uh, but we don't do any olfaction phenotyping, nor do we do any gustation phenotyping. So the question is, and I'd like to, I'd like to hear what some of the non-IMPC members feel about this and maybe your recommendations for what the IMPC should do, is should we focus, if we had to choose, should we focus on phenotyping, olfaction, and gustation on all genes? As we just learned, there are some genes that have an impact on taste and smell, and but they have also have an impact on aging, neurodegenerative disease, and so on. Or should we go back to those taste receptor gene, genes and the olfactory receptor genes themselves uh -huh. and maybe do some general phenotyping on produce those and do general phenotyping on those and maybe to discover something that we just don't know yet so if we had our druthers what what would all of you think about that um what where where if we had to pick one or the other where where do you think we should go Okay, can I add some comment and opinion about that? Sure. Okay, simply I mean just to bias the sample collection or unbiased the sample collection. Because taste receptor genes and olfaction receptor genes, we easily may guess that then then mice surely involved in can be involved in there are some abnormal uh, phenotype of olfaction and a taste. However, we have to think about the, what is the big advantage of IMPC broad spectrum pipelines? That means we can make uh, some relationships among different types of uh, phenotypes. For example, brain issues with olfaction issues or heart rate issues with taste issues. So we have to make a uh, determine what's, what is the, our first line goal because we have a, we don't have enough money and a time and a, yeah, depending on that, I think. Uh, my, my suggestion is, I mean, we can make a try. Uh, for example, 30 lines of uh, biased issues, another 30 lines of unbiased issues. Maybe we can make uh, some relationships among known and unknown genes led to with olfaction and a taste. This is my first recommendations. I'd, I'd be curious to hear what others think of, think of that. Yeah, Chang Um, can I just say? Oh. Okay. Go ahead, oh, Dr. Kim. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, second first. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have done uh, many um, yeah, olfactory phenotyping with many genes in in KMPC. Um, we have done a lot of gene, such as um, um, member in proteins or. Or it is uh, it is kind of a uh, we think that is um, related to uh, the sensory 
but almost all mm, uh, knockout uh, mouth uh, we we assume that it is related to the affection or test almost all uh, affection was uh, completely normal i mm. i think uh, it it could be uh, uh, why because uh, affect Olfaction is uh, well, very important for the reproduction and uh, for living. So it is conserved. So I think um, uh, we have to focus on the specific gene for olfaction or test, uh, taste, not for all gene uh, for olfactory uh, phenotyping. So we have to focus on a small group of uh, genes that could be related to the olfaction or test, taste. Mm. Got it? <laughs> it's a little, a little hard to hear you, Dr. Kim, maybe speak into your microphone, but if okay. I understand correctly, <laughs> I think you are suggesting that probably not wise to apply olfactory phenotyping to all genes yeah 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 pick yeah pick out a few right. genes that we hypothesize could have an impact uh on olfaction as well as other phenotypes so mm -hmm. when you say olfactory genes are you referring to actual olfactory receptor encoding genes or uh, GPCRs, or are you thinking of a, a more broader definition? I I said that it 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 could be a broad uh, spectrum of olfactory related genes. Yeah, it um it could be uh, um uh, neuron specific gene or G uh, uh G protein coupled receptor genes, something something like that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Dr. Abraham, before your question, can I add up some comment on related to whether I mean challenges I mean recommendations? Because I mean, I just wanted to share a parallel study of uh, uh, olfaction test uh, in KMPC. Very simple. There are too many olfaction related genes, olfaction receptor families. However, among them, just a small portion of genes closely related with abnormal olfaction phenotypes. Uh, adding them, just to neuron-specific phenotype genes show the very abnormal olfaction phenotypes. I mean, much higher levels, much higher portion compared with the olfaction-related uh, genes itself. That's a very, I mean, small experience. Yeah. OK, Abraham, you can. Yeah, you can. Um, yeah, I think as uh, Professor Lloyd pointed out, uh, the uh, the genes that are hypothesized to have some impact on different disorders uh, may be given with a priority. But I think that the the uh, the phenotyping uh, uh, the whole genes, it's not uh, it's not that much work if we opt to uh, you know go for uh, for example there are some completely automated assays that are developed in some labs. Uh, for example, Angier Schaefer's lab in, uh, in London, they are trying to develop the completely automated uh, behavioral assay where you can phenotype it day and night. You just put the animals and uh, everything is automated. Um, and uh, so that's not too much work if we, if we select that kind of uh, behavioral assays. And of course, I mean, the, the priority can always be given with, you know, the hypothesized genes. And uh, I think the, uh, the other point is on uh, phenotyping the olfactory receptors. I don't know, I mean, how much ben uh, beneficial this would be because it is always at the periphery. And uh, in many uh, disorders, we have to always go beyond the sensory periphery. Therefore, I think uh, giving uh, you know, the priority for the genes uh, beyond the sensory periphery. Uh,
think we may have lost Dr. Abraham. No, nope, there he's coming back. Dr. Abraham, can you hear us? Okay, it looks like we may have we may have uh, we may have difficulty with this audio. So, Sylvia, did, uh, did you want to say um, maybe take one of the questions that you had posed to us, which I thought was brilliant, um, because you probably thought of some answers already <laughs> for those. Why don't you take one of those uh, and uh, maybe challenge the group for some input? Um, now, first of all, I want to know from other experts, um, uh, because I had this problem when I started to, to use olfactory tests, that I had many doubts, and I still have. So every time I'm asked, should we do an olfactory test, I say, mm, maybe we should think about it, because... I don't know, unless you have this uh, fancy equipment and you are an expert on olfactory function, that is a different story. But if you have a uh, normal lab and you have to invest in olfactory tests, uh, if you don't do it, why Why you don't? Is it because it's <laughs> unreliable, as was mentioned before? Mm, he said, forget behavioral tests, they are unreliable for this function. Or because it's time consuming, that there could be a, probably is one of the biggest uh, limitation with this. Also because in IMPC, this is our uh, constraint. Now we need to have everything done quickly, uh, large scale with so many mice. And sometimes this is very uh, in contrast, especially in behavioral measures, in behavioral assessment and olfaction from what I see from my point of view cannot be distinguished from the behavioral repertoire of the animal. So I, I'm fascinated with all the research that is done on specific aspects of olfactory system and function, which is fantastic. But for me as a behavioral neuroscientist, I cannot uh, forget that there is an, another world of behaviors around olfaction and even more than we think because olfaction is so pervasive that you cannot exclude all the others. And, and it feels like you are neglecting one of the most important sense that mouse have. We are, we, are doing, we are testing hearing, we are testing vision somehow, but we are completely neglecting olfaction. So I think we should find a way. So I, my, my question to the audience is, I'm sure many of, of the audience have, have faced this problem. I should test olfaction. And I didn't. Why? Why I didn't? Sylvia, it's it's a great great comment. It looks like we have some some folks that might have some responses to you. I'm I'll just I'll just say first that I it's a very very good point. And bluntly, I think it was a, a valuation decision. Taste and smell isn't as important as all these other things we do. I think today the three of you have proved that wrong. Taste and smell is extremely important. So Anne, Anne Flanagan, go ahead. Um, thanks, Ken. I was just gonna say, Sylvia, if we could come up with a test where we didn't have to separate males for two or three days, which we can't do, and then put them back together, then I'm all for giving it a go. But that's, that's one of the problems, right? Is the length of time takes to do one of those tests. Um, so, there's something else we could do instead that we thought was validated and could get information from that was like the eye phenotyping. You know, it's just you just take it out and you do the testing. All these other things, the ABR, we're not um, removing them from their, their cage mates for long periods of time. And to, to what extent do you think we could, we're all now starting to get these home cage monitoring systems uh, that you can put mice in for days. Um, to what extent do you think that might overcome the challenge you just brought up about some of these tests taking so long? And well, but you're you can't. Uh, well, yeah, I see your point. I guess you could watch how often one mouse approaches, you know, a stick that's got odorant on it, right? Because it's video plus. Um, 
I, I guess I would worry that things would get moved around a lot um, when you have multiple mice, if you had four mice in the home cage monitoring cage. What do you think, Sylvia? I don't know if it would be as simple to do, um, but maybe Kent, maybe that's an idea. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this and I'm sure that if we give some time for thoughts and we combine a group of people, we can come up with some procedure that could be. Mm. Okay. So it would have to be something but, that you can But it will, it, will require, it will require some time and validation. I don't know yes. if we have. But uh, I was thinking, for example, that some of this procedure can be accommodated so not to have so much isolation of the mice or so many days of habituation. There, there could be some, some adjustments. And in terms of on-cage monitoring, one option, I don't know, I'm just trying to find solutions because nobody has mentioned this, but we should. We should keep attention to bedding and diet. And these two uh, aspects are is something that we deal with every day and we give it for granted that we have that bedding, we have that diet and we don't even care what they what is their smell and what is the taste of this diet. So in home cage monitoring, probably we should manipulate these two variables in a way that we see what is the reaction to different beddings or different diets and I don't know, find information on these two functions, just a speculation. I guess that's one of the problems is transferal of the smell to the bedding from the stick if there's mice moving it around and things. I no, guess no, you I'm thinking one... about bedding just as a stimulus, no sticks. Oh, because okay. different, different, different types of woods, different types of bedding at different odors. We don't know that, but mice do. For sure. I yeah. totally agree with that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, Bedding right. is very important point. Yeah. That, that could be an option to change stimulus without mm, too many different equipment or manipulations. You change the type of bedding. And I don't know how it's feasible on a large scale on different facilities. I have no idea. But then what would you what would you look at? How much they sniff or like what what is your what you do you could, look you at could, when you change the You bedding? could uh, see if how the motor uh, behavior is changing, if there is a change in the uh, place of nest, uh, in some other behaviors. I mean, you have to uh, interpret from okay. indirect yeah. behaviors. And unfortunately, it's not right. a indirectly right. measured. It's not sniffing anymore. It's whatever yeah. their other behaviors, how it's affected by smell. Yeah, but that is a it's stimulus. Okay. That is an odor and stimulus. Yeah, right. Thanks. Okay, I don't rec I wanna recommend it. Two issues. One is, I mean, we can make some survey. Do you have a plan to launch olfaction test in your center? And if not, okay, if yes, what's the reason? So what is your guess? And uh, what age? You know, maybe both the sexes. And uh, additionally, do you do you wanna extend? I mean, the other method to define the olfaction test including immunochemistry or something. We can make some survey across the center. That will be the first. And the second issue is, I mean, all three speakers, they already show up their very well-defined olfaction test. However, there is, I mean, too much sophisticated in some institutions. So let's make a very simple and a quick uh, SOPs among the centers. That should be the second. I, I want to recommend the two points. I think those are good good ideas, JK. Um, something worth maybe the centers uh, getting together and, and discussing that. If we could, because again, if we take a step back, and this is for the benefit of those attending that aren't IMPC members, that you know our 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 focus as the IMPC is to take genes for which we don't know what they do or. There's very little known, very little functional annotation and, uh, and provide information on them. What do they do? So the tests that we've applied for phenotyping have kept that in mind. To that is, is does this knockout cause uh, a behavioral phenotype? And so we've selected behavioral phenotypes that are relatively simple to do or do they cause some morphological abnormality? So we've selected some phenotyping tests to do that. And merely to say there's something maybe here. And then 
you in the research community sees that data and says, aha, this is something I want to pick up and now do a deep dive. What's the what? Next, what else is going on? And this then helps you build your research. So maybe to, in, in response to JK, your suggestions is maybe there are some relatively simple, moderately high throughput uh, olfaction and gustation tests that we could apply to open that door. Again, to be able to say to people, there's something here with this gene and it might be worth doing a deeper dive and get it for your research. I think there could be some value in that. So I agree with you, JK. Okay, if you agree, I will prepare just the first version of just a simple survey format. And uh, you can make better and better and we will circulate it across the centers. Fantastic. Well, let's see, is there anybody else who has any other questions or thoughts that they'd like to bring up before we turn this back to uh, Poppy for some final, final words? Uh, can I ask it to John, John Orzman? Because I mean, olfaction is closely related to with uh, energy consumption and a uh, sensing of energy. So just the olfaction test is closely related to with uh, something abnormal and a uh, normal phenotype from energy consumption and expenditure. So how about new ideas, John? Maybe you have a uh, great idea. Yeah. First of all, hello everybody, good to see you. And I'm really fascinated by all the talks and the input I heard today. I think there could be uh, a link when it's, for example, for overeating on the diet. And that could be due to olfaction or kind of impact of a gene mutation <clears throat> on these functions. But I think that's more relevant and you're really feeding a, an attractive diet where you can promote this overeating. So with the chow diet that most people use, I would, I'm not so sure if that's something uh, where, we, where we could expect such a, such a link, but uh, I'm pretty sure nobody has ever done it. So this is also something um, we are kind of, there's a lot of guessing and uh, people don't really know what you could expect. Um, rewarding, yeah. I mean, it would be, I think it's a different paradigm if you really, uh, um, like Sylvia described, give attractive or let's say palatable fluids with different energy content. Um, and in that case, you would need to make sure that it's not a question of olfaction, uh, but it is really linked to a rewarding system, for example, of malfunctioning regulation of uh, of diet intake. But <clears throat> I think that's rather we, the other way around. And right now, I have to think about it, actually, and I'm happy to continue the thinking. I don't know what other people think. Oh, def most definitely. I think it's, a, it's a, I think there's, Clearly, one of the things that's arisen from this workshop today and the presentations is it's, it's um, you know, piquing our interest in things and ideas that we hadn't thought of before. And that's great. And so I definitely think there's something to look at here when it comes to energy metabolism and diet and, and so on in the relationship. So I, I, would, I would support that. Anyone else? Final words, final comments. All right, well, let me take this opportunity um, to, before I turn this back over to Poppy, to um, first thank my co-chair, uh, Dr. J.K. Song, for co-leading, co-organizing this presentation workshop uh, with me. And, and without question, I want to thank our three speakers, Dr. Kim, where it's now after midnight, long after midnight there in Seoul. Um, so I appreciate you hanging there. <clears throat> Dr. Abraham from Pune, who's, it's also getting kind of late in the evening there in India. And of course, 
Silva, Dr. Mendio in, in Rome, thank you so much uh, for not only today and the, these last couple of hours, but also the time that you put in preparing for this workshop and, and working with us and, uh, and really presenting such wonderful uh, science. I'm going to turn this now, and of course, last but not least, is I want to thank Poppy, uh, who is our <clears throat> IMPC executive assistant, who's really been uh, taking care of all the logistics, organization, communication, and making all this happen, and also with Maya Van Zenten at the NIH, who's been extremely helpful with organizing this workshop. All right, JK, I guess it's time we can turn this back over to Poppy. So. Thank you, Poppy. Uh, yes, hello. Um, so before we uh, close, I would just like to remind people of the calendar of events we have planned for this year. So the next uh, meeting, which happens in person, will be in Cape Town, South Africa, organized by Professor Anne Grobler, one of the members of the IMPC. This is the first ever IMPC meeting to be hosted in, in Africa, in the African continent. It will take place uh, between the 28th and 30th of April, and it's entitled Beyond the Genome. The topics are mostly directed towards the non-coding uh, genome and the impact of epigenetics on phenotype and disease therapy. Uh, the website that I'm showing here is the website where you can find all the information, submit your abstracts, um, register, make the accommodation uh, reservations, and uh, see the updates on the agenda. Uh, the next meeting we have uh, lined up uh, will take place in uh, mid-September. It will be hosted by the Czech Center for Phenogenomics, and it is scheduled to happen on the 17th and 18th of September in Prague in the Czech Republic in Europe. So um, this is all I had to say regarding the future events. And um, uh, finally, I would just like to add that there will be a follow-up email uh, after we close uh, today's workshop. Uh, with information on where you can find the recording. Uh, we may uh, add it on the IMPC website, uh, the IMPC cloud, without the need to uh, log on, or we may explore YouTube, a YouTube location. Uh, this will um, come in your inbox. Also, if you have any comments or ideas or anything you could, would like us to collate and send to the organizers uh, for follow-up activities, please uh, make sure you email me. Um, I'm sure you've had the email or, or Maya, and we can coordinate to, to share this information with others. So thank you. Okay, I'm always waiting for you. Any kind of comment on these old factions or yes, even though there's a very small tip that will be very valuable for our future spec. Also, I will prefer just the first draft of a survey and uh, circulate it uh, with our members. Also, I hope to, hope to see you, all of you at Cape Town. That's a really first time for all of us in Africa meeting. So see you there. Okay, we will close this meeting. Yes, Kent, you can. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, thanks. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. And especially thank, thank you for all speakers. Great. Right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, thank you all. Thank you.